It is the end of the year and I am very tired. I am a big reader of The Economist and I have decided in this video to squeeze as many facts that I have learned from reading The Economist this year into one video. I hope you enjoy. I knew that someone from Nigeria is a Nigerian, but what is someone from Niger? The answer to that is Nigerian or Nigerian. Nigerian. This of course was the year of Trump and out of all the Trump facts that I learned this year the most staggering for me was that 38% of Trump primary voters wish the South had won the Civil War and 38% were unsure. In the United States only 47% of people say that relations between blacks and whites are good down from 68% in 2008. But in actual fact in some ways the United States is becoming more tolerant. For example in 1964 the American Civil Liberties Union agreed that homosexuals should be barred from government jobs. As recently as 1995 only half of Americans approved of mixed race marriages. And Alabama was the last state to legalize interracial marriage in 2000. Now 90% of Americans approve of interracial marriage and more than 1 in 10 of marriages are between people of different ethnicities. In 1980 the average black urbanite lived in a district that was 61% black, now that is 45. And out of 52 big American metropolises with large black populations, 45 have seen segregation fall since the year 2000. Now southern cities are less segregated than northern ones. Now related to Trump, let's talk about things that politicians say. Here we have to start with the President of the Philippines. Rodrigo Duterte. Rodrigo Duterte? While campaigning he promised to end crime by tossing the bodies of criminals into Manila Bay to fatten the fish. Since he became president approximately 6,000 drug dealers and drug users have been killed without trial. When Pope Francis visited last year he caused huge traffic jams. Duterte said, Pope you son of a bitch, go home. About his womanizing? Without Viagra I have a difficult time. If Barack Obama criticized his killing he would call Mr. Obama a son of a whore. In response to Singapore's execution of a Filipino maid? Fuck you. About human rights abuses? Fuck you. About the killing of a Filipino journalist? Just because you're a journalist you are not exempted from assassination if you're a son of a bitch. Recently he said he had personally killed suspected criminals while mayor of the city of Davao. Elsewhere, now Foreign Minister of the United Kingdom Boris Johnson wrote a poem about the President of Turkey. A young fellow from Ankara who was a terrific wanker. Robert Fico, Prime Minister of Slovakia, called reporters investigating corruption dirty anti-Slovak prostitutes and compared one to a toilet spider. Serbian Prime Minister Alexander Vucic last year employed former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom Tony Blair. Blair. Some years ago he co-edited a book titled English Gay Fart Tony Blair. But I think my favourite one that I read about came from 10 years ago when Chancellor of Germany Angela Merkel met Russia's Vladimir Putin. Putin, knowing Merkel's fear of dogs, brought his black Labrador into the room. Mrs Merkel froze. Putin smirked. Her response, later to journalists, I understand why he has to do this. To prove he's a man. Russia has nothing. No successful politics or economy. All they have is this. Also in politics, in the Republican primary for the 2012 US election, then governor of Texas Rick Perry had this to say. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, uh, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> you yeah. can't name the third one? The third agency of government. Yeah. I can't. The third one I can't, sorry. <laughs> Oops. He later confirmed that the third agency was the Department of Energy, which Donald Trump has just made him secretary of. I learned all sorts of things about stealing money. For example, did you know that it's estimated that worldwide governments only detect about 20 cents of every hundred dollars of laundered money? In Argentina on the morning of June 14th of this year, a man with an automatic rifle was caught throwing bags over a convent wall in a suburb of Buenos Aires. When police arrived he tried to bribe them. The bags contained nine million dollars of banknotes. Who was he? His name was Jose Lopez and for 12 years he was the Minister of Public Works in the previous two Argentine government. In Nigeria a minister reckoned that just 55 people stole 6.8 billion dollars in the past seven years. This year in China a Ponzi scheme was broken up in which 900,000 people were scammed out of 7.6 billion dollars. The managers buried their account books deep underground to avoid detection and it took police 20 hours to dig them out. In the exciting world of international shipping South Korean container line Hanjin shipping collapsed. This left 66 ships carrying goods worth 14.5 billion dollars stranded at sea. Harbors around the world refused them entry for fear of going unpaid. 14.5 billion dollars is a lot of money. If that were the GDP of a country that would be 118th in the world according to the IMF's ranking of countries by nominal annual GDP. The value of goods stuck at sea was more than the nominal annual GDP of Jamaica, Laos, Nicaragua, Albania, Mongolia and 68 other countries. The Prime Minister of India had to speak out against vigilantes and cow defence squads. Recently there have been a series of attacks against Muslims and low caste Hindus accused of harming cows or eating beef. <laughs> A year ago in a village near Delhi, a mob beat to death a Muslim father of three on suspicion that he had eaten beef. One of the killers died in custody and a government minister attended the funeral where the casket was draped in an Indian flag. Of course cows are considered sacred in India and you can see retirement villages for cows advertised on television.
Most of India's 29 states ban or restrict the slaughter of cows. Yet, at the same time, India is probably the world's biggest exporter of beef. However, that beef is nearly all water buffalo. This year in South Korea, President Park Geun-hye was impeached in a story that has all the elements of a Greek tragedy. Miss Park grew up in the presidential palace, the Blue House. In 1961, when she was nine years old, her father, Park Chung-hee, seized power in a coup. <laughs> First pictures from Seoul following the pre-dawn military coup that overthrew the South Korean government. Thirteen years later, a North Korean sympathizer attempted to assassinate him, missed, and killed her mother. <laughs> then, five years later, her father was assassinated. When her mother died, Miss Park fell under the sway of a cult leader, Choi Tai Min. He was the founder of an organization called the Church of Eternal Life and convinced Miss Park that he could contact her dead mother. WikiLeaks released an American diplomatic cable from 2007 in which it was asserted that Choi had complete control over Miss Park's body and soul during her formative years. Miss Park, now 64, is never married and she's estranged from her brother and sister. She's said to eat dinner alone. She wrote in her autobiography, In my life's scale, the worthwhile times have never outweighed painful ones. In 2013, Miss Park, now still very close with Choi's daughter, was elected president. Miss Choi then fell out with her young lover after she scolded him for going to play golf and neglecting her daughter's puppy. Annoyed, he began to collect evidence against her. Now Miss Choi is accused of using her relationship with Miss Park to get some of South Korea's biggest companies to donate $70 million to foundations that she owns, as well as twisting the arm of a university to admit her daughter. Apparently, Miss Park shared confidential information with Miss Choi. This, of course, is a huge abuse of of power. Miss Park's approval ratings plummeted to the lowest in Korean history. On the 12th of November, a million people marched in protest, and on the 9th of December, Miss Park was suspended as president. I also learnt about population decline. For example, in Europe, Poland is projected to lose 40% of its working age population by 2060. But this is most clear in Japan, which has lost 1 million people just since 2010. There are over 5 million people in Japan suffering from dementia. Last year, over 10,000 dementia sufferers went missing. Some walked into the paths of trains, for which their families are billed for the cost. Yahoo Japan has started Yahoo Ending, a service costing 180 yen a month until you die, which then sends an email alerting friends and family closes your internet accounts, and sets up an online memorial page. In Japan, fully 83% of firms report having trouble hiring people. Japan is a country in need of people and a country in need of workers. Yet foreigners only make up 2% of the population, compared to 12% across the OECD. It is extremely hard to become a Japanese citizen. One candidate reports officials looking in his fridge and inspecting his children's toys to see if he was Japanese enough. Last year, Japan welcomed 9,469 new citizens compared to 730,000 in the United States. And the United States welcomed 70,000 refugees. Germany welcomed somewhere around a million. Even New Zealand welcomed 1,350. Japan, the third largest economy in the world, accepted 27 refugees. China also has an aging population. Currently in China, one out of six people is over 65. In 10 years time, that will be one in four. And while at the moment there are 12 working age adults for every over 65, by 2050, that will be two and a half. Apart from a big group of Han Chinese, except from Vietnam in 1979, China in total has 583 refugees. That is fewer than its number of billionaires. And yes, that is billionaires in US dollars. And as it nears the end of the year, I learned that Saudi Arabia is switching from the Islamic to the Gregorian calendar. That brings it from the year 1438 to 2016. I also learned that it is 1395 in Iran, 2628 in Kurdistan, 57.76 in Israel's Knesset, and 25.59 in Thailand. To end on a high note, I'm hopeful that next year will be a good one for all of you. But not as hopeful as American college students, 65% of whom expect to become millionaires. Happy New Year, everyone.